Welcome to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller sitting in today on episode 52. We're coming from the Nasir Harris Podcast Studio at the Boyer House of the Somerdale Campus of Central Penn College. Very pleased to be joined today by uh, a return guest, uh, Megan Klein. Welcome to the show. Thank you. This is actually your second time being on the show, and you actually had the entire show last time, too. So you're going to. Yeah, you're going to have a good dossier of (laughs) podcasts that uh, you've been working on this term. We're also very fortunate to be joined by a very special guest from off campus today, uh, Sarah Shaw. Sarah came to do a presentation. February is Eating Disorder Awareness Month, and this is the, I believe, you said third time that you've been here on campus? I think so. Third or fourth. So we, first of all, would like to thank you so very much for coming down here after your presentation today. Um, We really appreciate uh, you coming down and spending some time with the Nightly News. Thank you. So happy to be here. Obviously, in within the story that's coming along with this podcast, I am going to put uh, a little bit more details about your background, but just in, in a sort of abbreviated fashion, can you just give sort of some of the background on how you got involved with doing these types of presentations, maybe a little bit about your history? Uh, so just to let some of the listeners know why this is something you're so passionate about today. Sure, yeah. Um, so when I was in college, I developed a really serious eating disorder. I was hospitalized. Um, I had a, a brush with death to make it sound a little bit more exciting than it actually was. And I have been going through a recovery journey ever since then. And so I used to work in student affairs, uh, student affairs and multicultural affairs at Hack in York. And I realized that eating disorders often manifest and they really grow in college when people are, students are finding themselves, they're a little bit unsure, there's a lot of factors that play in. And so I wanted to bring a speaker to campus to address that and to just really make things raw and put it out there. And I couldn't find anybody. And I realized, well, all right, I guess I'll do it. I mean, someone should be doing this. So I developed the Mirror Mirror program. And after my first presentation, which at this point was when I was pregnant with my son. So four and a half years ago, I left that. I jumped in my car and I had that moment where I was like, oh, this is what you need to be doing, Sarah. This is it. This is what you should be doing. So that's it. Well, and certainly, um, you know, you you talked about it briefly, but, you know, we just got out of the presentation where you really went into a lot of detail on how this sort of manifested itself, not only from high school, but into your college years. Um, Speaking to a college audience, and and many of the people that are listening to this show are in the college uh, age, what is it about eating disorders that is sort of taboo in our society to talk about? It's not something that you hear very much of, and, and while there is support out there, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily as e- maybe as easy to find as it, as it should be. Why do you think that is? I think it has a lot to do with just the taboo we have on mental health in general, especially because this one is something that manifests itself physically. So there's a lot of you, you know, there's a lot of shame involved on the on the part of the person who's suffering. Um, nobody, it almost feels like a failure. Um, a lot of times the people who find themselves caught in an eating disorder are the type of people who are high achievers normally, people who struggle to always be the best at everything, who are competitive, who are perfectionists. And that's a blanket generalization because that certainly doesn't apply to everybody, but that that's typical. And so admitting that you have an eating disorder is, is embarrassing almost. Like I, I messed up here. Like I don't, I don't know how I let this happen to myself. And so on, on the part of everybody else, I, th- I think it's a lack of knowledge, like sort of that same way that you don't, you don't say anything because you don't know what to say. And so what I'm trying to talk about is maybe just saying anything is fine. Um, maybe just starting a conversation and being honest and real and speaking out. Maybe that's the beginning. Megan, speaking from somebody who is is a counselor on campus, what sorts of things maybe would you suggest to those out there that might be potentially struggling with an eating disorder? And maybe how can your office help? So yeah, my office obviously is for any students who are going through any kind of stressors. Um, Sarah even talked about it with her presentation that her lack of eating kind of became like a coping skill. It, It was kind of like a defense mechanism that if there was stress or some kind of trigger, that was the go-to for her. And I think that can be pretty common 
for, for students who maybe don't know themselves, how do I properly handle when, you know, maybe traumatic situations come on or any general stress and sometimes not eating or maybe overeating can definitely be their non-healthy coping. So when I do see students that are having some of these concerns, we'll obviously not just focus on the coping skills, but that can be a pretty big piece um, when it comes to this is trying to figure out what are healthy ways for you to, to manage when stress does come on, um, along with your emotions. And if the eating disorder is a, is a pretty significant piece, okay, let's look at those thoughts some more too and kind of dive a little deeper with, with um, you know, processing some of that stuff. Part of the reason that this resonates with me is, um, you know, I'm a bigger guy. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm, you know, I've, and I've always been a bigger guy. Um, now, unfortunately, I, I have put on a few pounds lately. But one of the things that, that I sort of drew some parallels to the things that you said, Sarah, uh, I, I kind of go in the other way. I, I know that sometimes I eat differently than I should when I'm stressed out. Uh, and, and I have definitely, I don't mean to, to blame, um, but I know that part of the reason that I've put on some weight over the past year or so is because of um, my father passing away. And uh, basically I'm, I'm still having some uh, family issues that are a result of that. And I, and I, and again, I'm, I'm not blaming anyone. And I just, I, I'm admitting that I know that that's an issue that I have, but it, it is difficult because people might go one way or the other. And it's just sort of that reaction to stress and, and grief and that, that really does make changes in your overall health because of how you eat. Yeah, definitely. I think it's funny how people do react and why food and eating is such a go-to for people. And I think it's really common. I mean, it's it's a cliche almost like, oh, my boyfriend broke up with me. I'm going to go get some ice cream. And that's fine. Like that's not, that's not problematic. I think the reason is because that feeling of hunger can numb you out in the same way that feeling full can almost make you feel fuller emotionally. Do you know what I mean? Like it's filling a void just like it's filling your stomach or you could take it the other way and maybe you don't want to feel any of that. Unfortunately, what comes with eating less or losing weight is just a series of affirmation like, oh my gosh, you didn't eat lunch today. Oh, you're so good. I was so bad. I had a French fry. So it's this cultural thing that happens that regardless of whether or not somebody had to lose weight, they are positively reaffirmed when they do. And so that's what keeps that cycle going. You had mentioned something that I really wanted to talk about, and it's going to segue into my next question. And this, this is as close to a quote as I can get. So if I'm misquoting here, please let me know. But you said in the presentation that we just came from, people are programmed to say how great you look when you lose weight. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose that is? How have we all been conditioned to, to comment on people's weight only when they're losing weight or they're looking healthy as opposed to different, you know, other ways, whether it's up, down or in the middle? Right. Nobody says to you, wow, you gained some weight. Good for you. You know, nobody says that even, even if maybe that's better for them. Maybe that's where their body rests more comfortably. Um, nobody says that. Oh, it makes me so angry because there are so many things that play into it. There are a lot of people making a lot of money by making other people feel bad about the way they look. And the easiest way that they can do that is to make them want to lose weight and they can sell you products to make you do that. And they can sell you versions of food to make that happen. They can create whole television shows about shaming people who are overweight into losing that weight and then congratulating them and rewarding them when they do. And I think that all of the media that we consume programs us in some way, whether or not we realize it. The more self-aware we are, then the, the better, obviously. But the things that we see and the things that we tune into, they all play a part in how we interact with our world as well. So so I think that's what it is. I think we see it happening. One of the statistics that I, I like to talk about is that only 5% of women, specifically in America, naturally possess the ideal body image that we see in advertising. Well, that leaves the rest of the 95% of us to be like, well, I guess that's what I should look like because we see it everywhere. My background is in media studies. And it's funny because I remember I was asked into a class at, to talk about the portrayal of women in the media. And I was talking about this exact subject. And I remember when I walked into the classroom, you know, I'm a big 200 plus pound guy to come and talk about how women are portrayed in the media. And I had a lot of people. And in fact, I remember one student specifically said, 
what do you know? You're not a guy, or you're not a woman, and you're a big guy. You're not thin. So how would you be able to comment on this? And that was sort of part of the thing that really struck me and said, you know what? This is this is part of the problem that we all think that you have to be a certain way to be able to have any kind of commentary on this issue. Megan, I mean, what do you think about the media and how responsible the media is for the way that that our own self esteem operates? Yeah, I think, and we've had conversations about this before. Um, especially with social media too, you know, and what the pictures that you're seeing people put out there and the advertisements and the commercials and it's all so photoshopped the majority of the time and people don't recognize that. They think, oh, this is that, if they can look like that, why can't I? What's wrong with me? You know, I'm, I'm going to the gym five, six times a week and I'm still not there. What What's the problem? And it does become this self-esteem issue in this, you know, what looking back at me and why, why can't I be good enough? Why can't I get to that point? And it gets so bad that you try and have that conversation. Well, that's not reality. Like Sarah said with that statistic right there, you know, they still are so focused on, but other people can get there. Why can't I, especially when they have friends posting stuff or telling them things. And it's, there's always this comparison that they're trying to get to this point or this level that maybe is completely unreachable. And the expectation is out of this world that they can't even get to so it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that they're they're not going to to get there they can't they physically cannot get there you know one of the things another quote that you made and you were talking about this idea of the dove evolution which you'd spoken about uh and and you made a comment i think we could do better and you you close sarah with some uh you know you had some pictures of um some uh, Ashley Graham and a, a few of the other, um, yeah, I don't want to call them plus size models, but unfortunately they're calling themselves that, which I think also perpetuates this idea. But that aside, I, I do think that we are making some strides as a society. However, you say that you think we can do better. Do you have any ideas of how we can do this better? Such a good question. Um, so I guess that's just something we we can and we can do better. So one of the examples I bring up in the in the presentation is Mindy Kaling, who's one of my favorite people on the planet because she's smart, she's funny, she's beautiful, she's just everything. Um, Plus, she's an Indian-American woman who writes and produces and directs and stars in her own television show. Um, And size-wise, she falls right in the normal range for the American woman, except on the show, they are constantly... And she writes the show, so they are making fat jokes and they're talking about how much food she ate that day and how she ate five bear claws. and so it's a step, right? Like, because we're seeing more normal, normal, I mean, normal is a obje- uh, subjective word, but um, we're seeing more women that represent us, except those women are being shamed right there. Or on This Is Us, Chrissy Metz is, she plays one of the the siblings on the show, Kate, and she's an incredible actress and um, does a really good job with the role. And most of her storylines, if not all, have to do with her weight and her losing weight so yeah it's great that we see somebody who isn't uh the typical woman that we see on tv except we still can't just accept her that way um there's still this idea that she needs to change um and to become more like the women that we're used to seeing so i guess i don't know it's it's so hard because i think there's always a way that we can we can try to do better. And maybe that's just showing more normal bodies. I know a lot of stores anymore are, or, or companies are making progress to committing to not Photoshopping as much. I think, I think they don't want to misspeak, but I think it's CVS who recently said that their models, they'll be noted on their screens for their beauty products. It'll say, has not been Photoshopped, has not been touched up. Except, that, I mean, they're still picking Mm-hmm. very thin very beautiful women so I don't know I, I and part of it is they won't keep selling it if we don't keep buying it and so that's a larger conversation that we need to have well and that's the problem too is that all of these companies all of these you know large media corporations live and die by the bottom line and so if they don't have advertisers they're not making money they're not able to exist in you know within their framework within their television station within their radio station whatever the problem is is that to your earlier point to sell these products you have to have a, an ideal goal and i think that that's what they're selling they're selling hey you could look like this 
if you do this, 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 and this, and that's what this individual has does, but, but they're not transparent about that. Yeah. It's like, this is just, you know, the girl next door. And, and to me, that's sort of offensive. And, and I'm so glad that you made a, a point about men because I don't know that people think about that a lot. However, I love The Rock. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I love the guy. Big fan of his movies. Been a big fan of him ever since he was actually The Rock. But this guy makes every man on the face of the planet look horrible because of how he looks. And, you know, he shows what he does in the gym. I mean, he literally just gets paid to work out. Yeah. If I got paid to work out, maybe I would look a little bit, you know, more like the, the stereotypical good-looking man. But this is also something that, that I see, too. You know, when I... You know, I'm married, and, and when I see my wife, you know, we can joke back and forth. Oh, you know, he's cute, whatever. And, I mean, it's all six-packs and, you know, the, the perfect hair and the perfect clothes. I mean, it's just not even realistic in today's day and age unless you just have a ton of money and you don't need to work and you can buy the nicest clothes. And so I'm so glad that you'd mentioned that, that this is something that, that affects all of us. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. And... And I think maybe that's it. Maybe if we can start slowly, culturally saying, well, no, I, I don't want to see that. Like I, And we are hearing more voices saying, I want to see people who look like me. Like I want to see, I see that. But that's not always why we go to the movies. It's not always why we tune into TV shows. Like we could hang out with our friends and see people like us. Like we want the the fantasy. We want to see, um, you know, beautiful teeth and perfect hair and and all of this. But maybe we maybe we don't like maybe that's just what we've, we've been told we want to or should see. That's all that's out there, though. Mm -hmm. So we don't even know what we don't know. We don't even know if we want to see something else because it's not an option. You know, people have to be beautiful men or women to get into modeling, to get into the movies. Ninety nine percent of the people. Obviously, we are making some progress. But I just I think we're a long, long, long way off. And I think as long as the makeup companies and the diet companies and, and people like that are, are putting so much money into advertising, I think we're further off than we hope. Maybe. I tell my students um, in, um, in the classes that I teach that the most, um, the most power you have is how you spend your money. Like you make a decision every time you purchase a product. And so um, there are companies out there who are making strides to – to do better. Um, so another another issue that I care about deeply is animal testing and animal cruelty. So I purposefully only buy cruelty-free products. And is that going to stop other products from being made? Well, no, but I mean, it's a step in the right direction and it's a step that I can make. Um, and so when you take that idea to body image, maybe do a little bit of research, maybe see what companies are putting out their ideals that you believe in and support them. Um, talk to your friends about them, tag them on social media, talk about, talk about what else is there. Um, one of my former students, uh, her name is Nabella Noor. Uh, she's a YouTube blogger. She's, she's, she's legit Instagram famous. Like she's got over half a million followers. Um, and so she does beauty videos and she, her family is, Middle Eastern. Um, she's Muslim. She's plus sized, and she she owns all of that. Um, and she started her channel because she said, you know, I wasn't seeing overweight brown girls being beautiful, um, except we are. Like we we can be, and she's stunning. Like this girl is, I mean, she's beautiful. But stuff like that, and there are five hundred thousand people watching her every day, um, and so that's something. You know, that's a start. I just wanted to close, and I'd like to comment from both of you. I wrote down some of the statistics that you used in your presentation today. You'd already discussed uh, that only 5% of women possess the body type portrayed in ads, but I also want to talk about a couple of other statistics that really stood out to me. Uh, the first one was 42% of first through third graders, girls, want to be thinner. 46% of 9 to 11-year-old girls are on diets. And 91% of college women have attempted to diet. Um, I guess to a certain point, I can, I don't, obviously, I don't think any of us agree, but we can understand the college level because, you know, in high school, in college, your image means a lot and, and how you look, unfortunately, has a lot to do with that. Do you think that this is something it, it hasn't always been this way with first, second, third yeah. graders. Nope. It hasn't always been this way with 9, 10, 11-year-olds. Year 
maybe outside of media factors, what do you think is the reason for some of this? It's infuriating. I mean, those are those are children who the very last thing they should be worried about is is whether or not they need to be on a diet. I mean, um, I think it's because we've given a lot of power, again, to the word fat. Kids throw that word around and it's hurtful. And I also think it's it's what is modeled and seen at home. Like if you're if you're a little girl and you're watching your beautiful mother eat a salad while the rest of your family's eating spaghetti and talking about how she needs to fit back into her clothes or she needs to go for a run that night, she's not saying to her daughter, you're fat. But what she is saying is it's important that you look a certain way. And it's important that I do that too. Um, if she sees her dad commenting on women that he sees on, on TV or, you know, watching or having copies of Sports Illustrated, well, the Sports Illustrated, frankly, has made, has had several cover models who are not typically sized, um, then that's a message too. So, you know, the messages are happening and, you know, little minds are like sponges. I mean, I have to be careful. I have to be really careful um, about what I say around my kids. And so I think I think that's part of it too. Megan, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, along with the the messages that you might be getting at home, it, it also goes back to okay, well, then they're going off to school or they're going over to friends' houses. What messages are they receiving there? Because you could have parents that are you know doing everything as right as they possibly could, but then they're hearing these other things or they're seeing stuff on TV, they're seeing maybe pictures in magazines, and they start to get their little brains going and and wondering different things. So I think absolutely the messages are, are so important. And we sometimes don't stop to think what maybe one little statement or phrase, what impact that might have. But sometimes it really sticks. I've, I've met, I'm a, a part-time practitioner outside of, of the college too in the evenings. And I've seen children as young as 10 who do, they, they come in and say, oh, I need to be skinnier because I, you know, this is what I, I heard or this is what I saw. And it's, it's crazy to think that you have to be that aware of of what you're saying around not even just little ones, but but everyone, um, because we don't know how that might skew their interpretation of different things. Of course. Well, I just want to thank you very much for uh, stopping by today. We're going to have you back on the next segment. Uh, Kathleen Tarr and Yuli Sadejo will be back uh, hosting that segment. So uh, we look forward to coming back. And, and I just I do want to thank both of you thank for coming you down for today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. So we'll be right back with the Nightly News podcast. And we'll be joined by Yuli Sadejo and Kathleen Tarr. I'm Dr. Melissa Whaler, Dean of Humanities and Sciences. And you are listening to the Nightly News podcast. Good afternoon, everyone. We're come back here with Yuli, Miss Sarah Shaw, and Megan Klein for our guest today, and we're gonna be continuing our session talking about body image and her presentation today that happened at Center Bank College. What made you want to tell your story? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think mostly it was uh, it happened in grad school. I was writing my thesis on anorexia, and I had a really great professor who was working with me one semester, and for our graduation project, we had to read from our thesis to the group, and I did, and I, I've always I've always been um, somebody who likes being up in front of people and talking and things like that, and my professor suggested it. She said, you know what, that was, that was great. Have you thought about taking this on as a, a touring topic? And I was like, no. That sounds like a great idea. Thanks. Um, and that's what started it. And what made you realize that you start having the eating disorder? Or... So back when it happened? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I wouldn't, if I were to be honest, I would say that I don't think I realized it was an eating disorder until it was over. Um, mm. Throughout the whole thing, I thought something must be wrong. I don't know what it is. I can't be anorexic. I'm Sarah Shaw, like, well, Sarah Hilton at the time. I get straight A's. I have friends. I have a boyfriend. I am a, like, no, like that. No, that's, that happens to other people. That doesn't happen to me. That happens to crazy people. And so it honestly wasn't until after treatment, after I was out of the hospital, after all of that, that I realized that, oh, right. That was me. That was me this whole time. Mm -hmm. Whoops. What is one piece of advice you give to any young men or women that are going through what you went through? If I had if I had the opportunity to only say one thing that would stick, it would be to get rid of scales in your home. Um, they are not welcome in my home, um, and your weight means nothing. Like it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. And once you can detach yourself from this idea that 
your self-worth is tied into a number on a scale, then you can start to really fill yourself with the idea that your self-worth belongs elsewhere. You know what I mean? Like it belongs in the activities that you do and the things that you, the activities you're partaking in, the, the school you go to, your friends, your family, your kids, your parents, your thoughts, your dreams. Like it doesn't have anything to do with how much you weigh or or anything like that. And that's a hard thing for people. Um, you don't have to get way to the doctor. I don't. They don't like it. Every time I go, they're like, can you step on the scale, please? And I'm like, no, I can't. I'm here for a sore throat. So thank you so much for asking. Um, But you don't have to. You have the right to say no. Um, So I do. I don't know how much I weigh. I haven't known how much I weighed in years, even when I was pregnant, Um, which they do have to weigh you then um, because they want to make sure you're gaining weight appropriately. I explained my history to my doctor and I got weighed every appointment backwards. So I never knew. Hmm. I didn't know that we can say no to the... You can say... You, you have your rights. <laughs> oh my gosh. Here's how I like to think of it. Your doctor's like your employee. You are paying them to take care of you. Hmm. So you have a say. And so, yeah, just say no. I say nicely. I'm like, no, thank you. When they ask me to step on the scale. And usually they're like, what? And I'm like, nope, skipping it. Thanks so much. No explanation cool. needed. Bye. Nice. Uh, what was it like for you to start on the road for recovery? Uh, starting on the road for recovery. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was so it was tough for me. I got out of the hospital. I relapsed almost immediately. I picked myself back up again. And it was a lot of that for years. I think anybody who has been through any kind of mental illness or addiction would say that recovery is not something you achieve. It's something you maintain. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I still would not say like I'm recovered from an eating disorder. I did it. It's over gone. Bye. Um, I would say I'm in recovery and I'm working at it all the time. So it was, I think for me, starting on that road was, was rocky and I am mostly doing great now, but it took a while. It took years. Yeah. What are some triggers that can cause you to feel like you're slipping back into your old ways? Totally different for everybody. For me, it's when I start to feel like I'm losing control of a situation, uh, or, there's a big change. Um, so one of the most recent relapses that happened, like a, a serious one for me was maybe five or six years ago, maybe a little more than that. I don't know. Time is funny. Um, so I was in a relationship and it ended and I was very into this guy. And in hindsight, he sucked. He was not Aww. a good guy. Um, but Uh, He ended the relationship and that was the first time that's ever happened in my life. I was always the person who ended it and I, I I stopped eating. I, I, I really, I relapsed almost immediately. I lost a lot of weight. I stopped eating. And, um, for a while I thought like, wow, I was really upset about that guy. I must've really cared about him until I realized, well, no, like it had nothing to do with him. He sucked. It was because I lost control of the situation and that freaked me out. So that's what it is for me. I think it's probably different for everybody. Yeah. What was the feeling when you can't do, do you, is there a feeling when you do your recovery and then you're feeling alone or has been somewhere, someone always been there for you? Um, a you? lot of it is, is, is lonely. I have taken the approach anymore of just oversharing like a lot. Uh, I talk way too much about my feelings with everybody. Like it's, I have um, two of my best friends are we, we do it like we do a lot of stuff together. Our kids are friends. Um, and before I was part of their friendship, they were they would they would say is we did a lot of activities. And now all of a sudden Sarah shows up and talks about her feelings all the time. And I do. I'm like constantly like just checking in like, hey, are you OK? Can we talk about that? How did that make you feel? Um, because I like to talk about that stuff. And that keeps me accountable. And my husband is used to it, too. Like nothing really goes by without us having to have a conversation about it. And he's great, so he's fine with that. So yeah, it's it's a little bit of both. Um, a lot of it's internal anymore because I've been dealing with it and thinking about it for so long. But a lot of it is just being honest with the people around me about what's going on in life. Do you have like a specific quote that really helped you through the entire process? Oh, like a like an inspirational quote or like a mantra or something? Oh my gosh, probably. I cannot think of anything right now. Um, I was very much like typical college girl like I had a journal where I'd like write quotes and cut out things and I can't think of anything off the top of my head um no uh, let me let I'll think about it okay okay give me a second you can keep asking stuff but I can't think of anything right now 
Why is body image such a negative connotation these days? So it's complicated. Like I think there's not a simple answer for that.、Um, it doesn't have to be. You know, like we could make body image something that's great and everybody loves the way that they look.、Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the, I think the simple answer is. One, like I said earlier, a lot of people are making a lot of money by making us feel bad about the way they look, that we look,、um, and those people don't want to to lose that money. We talked earlier about in the in the earlier segment about how it's even though a lot of the problem is female driven,、um, you know what role do men play in that? When in fact, in most of the people who are in charge of those companies and those businesses and the consumers are men, and so I think they have a lot. I think they have a lot to do with with the solution, and so, it it also has to do with us. Like as a society, it gives us something to focus on, and it gives us it gives us a goal to have or something we can unite around. Like the biggest loser competitions at in offices, which drive me nuts.、Um, <laughs> and then you know gyms, and we meet there and we can work out together.、Um, but there are other ways、um, to find community without making us feel bad about ourselves. Is what I would say. What do you think causes the most Eating disorders. Like, what do you think is the main cause? I've thought about this for a long time.、Yes. I think it's a lot. I think it has to be like a perfect storm of who you are, like biologically, genetically, and the situations that you're put in.、Um, hmm. I think if one or the other didn't match up, it wouldn't happen. Because、hmm. there are a lot of people who are. Who went through the same experiences? Who go away to college?、Mm-hmm. Everybody goes like a lot of people go away to college. A lot of people are worried about gaining weight. A lot of people go on diets. Not everybody ends up eighty-two pounds in the front doorstep of a hospital、mm-hmm. being admitted. You know, and I think it has to do with the way you're raised. It has to do with your genetics.、Um, some people probably physically couldn't just stop eating. They would get very sick.、Um, mm-hmm. I didn't. I was. I. That's just the way my body worked. So I think it's a lot. It's a combination of a lot of factors.、Hmm. Very interesting. I just want to close out,、um, Megan. You are wonderful here, doing what you do as the counselor. If there's anybody out there that is feeling like maybe they're having some issues dealing with stress, or maybe it's even developed a little further than that, and maybe they they do see that that they're having some issues that we've talked about today, can you please feel free to give any advice you feel applicable, or, or if nothing else, you know, how can we get in touch with you? Yeah, so I mean, any my contact information as far as、um, coming to see me, I'm up in Bollinger Hall, room fifty seven upstairs.、Um, so if you ever want to pop in to talk about whatever, you can do that. You can email me counselor at centralpen dot edu.、Um, that's usually the easiest way to get in touch with me because it goes right to my phone. So day, night, whatever, as long as I'm awake, I'll get it and can respond. But as far as all of what we've been talking about goes, I think one of the things that can be pretty crucial in in the work that I do with people. Who are suffering from eating disorders? A, a big piece of it, not the only piece, but a big piece of it, is helping them to find their voice and recognize their self confidence and and their you know self worth. Like Sarah had mentioned earlier, I think can be so crucial because with all of these messages going around that they've heard from social media, from their families, from friends, from advertisements, whatever, it can be really easy to get lost in all of that and not even know where my thoughts begin and where society. Begin, or if it is the eating disorder, you know, one of the things I always work with people is identifying identifying your thoughts versus the eating disorder thoughts because they're two very separate things, and being able to identify the difference can be pretty crucial in your recovery process. So I think that's one of the the big things to to think about. And when you're coming in and talking with me, or and maybe another therapist, that's going to be a piece that will most likely get touched on too because it is. Important、uh, with everything else that you're you're working on with your treatment. So don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to talk about this stuff.、Um, just I think it's knowing who those support people are in your life that you can go to. And even if you feel like maybe you can't reach out to friends or family because they won't understand, finding whether it's a counselor or you know a reliable professional that you can touch base with is can be really helpful. So you don't feel like you have to figure this out on your own, or you don't have to feel like you're the only one experiencing some of this stuff. Fantastic! Thank you very much. And Sarah, thank you very much for joining us today. Do you have any final thoughts to share with the audience as a sort of a, a parting words of wisdom? I guess the only thing I would ask is that. Um, I talked earlier about just talking about things and being open. And the one thing I ask 
of people who come to my program is just to continue the conversation. Like if you heard something or thought of something or it sparked something, like start that conversation with somebody, talk about it. You'd be surprised how much people want to talk about this stuff. I am inundated with phone calls and emails after every time something goes out, like there was an article in Pen Live or one of these presentations, like people want to talk about it. So, so be that person to start the conversation. Well, if we'd like to start that conversation with you, how could we get in touch with you? That was a great segue. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can contact me at sarahshawspeaking at gmail.com or find me on Facebook, Sarah Shaw or sarahshawspeaking.com. Perfect. Well, i just like to thank everybody today. Obviously, we had a full house, so I do apologize that we didn't have another microphone for everybody. But seriously, this was um, – I asked Megan. I've been asking about having you on for months and months and months now. So we really, really appreciate you being on the last podcast of the winter term, Sarah. Oh, man. Thanks. And Megan, as always, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you down. And I certainly look forward to having you back again next term to promote things you're doing in the counseling Absolutely. office. Absolutely. Thank you. And of course – Kathleen Tarr and Yuliani Sadejo, uh, wonderful students. And un- unfortunately, Yuli, um, this will probably be your last podcast, Yuli. Um, Yuli will be graduating. She's in her last class right now. This is the last nightly news podcast of the term. Uh, Yuli has started her own podcast, so I do look forward to having a few more episodes of that. But Yuli, um, just from the nightly news perspective, I just want to well, thank you very much for, for everything. So. Uh, it's it's gonna we're gonna miss you very much. So, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome, Yuli. All right. So for Sarah Shaw, for uh, school counselor Megan Klein, for Kathleen Tarr, for Yuliani Sadejo, this is Professor Paul Miller, and we'll catch you next time on the Nightly News Podcast.